Perception is reality, or at least must be treated that way. With public personas, past and present, just one click away, social technology invariably influences one's ability to lead. If a leader's greatest tool is himself, then he ought to adhere to a leadership style authentic to his own character. So, in his pursuit of authenticity, he must remain conscious of the way he presents himself both in person and in the virtual world. External sources have boundless freedom in forming a public image of the leader, whether a true reflection or not. The reputation the leader forms with his people, the imprint he leaves on social outlets, and the perceptions that are created from other sources either degrade or enhance a leader's ability to genuinely connect with others and to lead inspirationally. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first panel, the conscientious leader operating within the realm of perception. Lieutenant Commander Wood will run this, mod or run this panel. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I'm Lieutenant Commander Jenny Wood. I'm an information warfare officer in the United States Navy, and I am also a junior permanent military professor here at the Naval Academy. I teach in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I have the honor, honor of being your moderator for today's panel, uh, the first panel entitled The Conscientious Leader Operating Within the Realm of Perception. So we just got a quick overview, but while you are sitting here for just a minute and before I introduce our panelists, just take a second and ask yourself a couple of questions. So if a leader's greatest tool is himself, then he ought to adhere to a leadership style authentic to his own character. How should a leader consciously present himself both in person and in the virtual world to maintain his authenticity? How do external sources form the public image of the leader, whether or not they are a true reflection? What are the impacts of the boundless freedom they enjoy? And third, how does the reputation the leader forms with his people, the imprint he leaves on social outlets, and the perceptions that are created from other sources degrade or enhance a leader's ability to genuinely connect with others and to lead inspirationally. So we have four really diverse, really exciting panelists, and here's our plan for the morning. I'm gonna give a brief introduction, and I just pulled out a couple of highlights, full bios are in your programs. I'm gonna give a brief introduction of each of these panelists individually, and I'm gonna give them some time to share their personal and professional experience on these topics with you. Now, if you think of questions during this time, great. Hold on to them, make a note, because after all of our panelists finish talking, we're gonna have a lot of time to do some questions and answers afterwards. So, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jim Brady. Mr. Brady is the CEO of Stomping Ground, a mobile-focused local news startup. He's the former editor-in-chief of Digital First Media, he also served as the executive editor of WashingtonPost.com, which among other awards, won a national Emmy for its Hurricane Katrina coverage. He was also in charge of the coverage of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and the 2000 presidential election at America Online. Please help me give Mr. Brady a warm welcome. Thank you. You're up. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought everybody was being introduced. My apologies. Um, yeah, I, you know, I have been uh, in digital now uh, as of April, this coming April, I've been on the digital side of journalism for 20 years, which is about as long as one can be in the digital side of anything uh, in the news space, because that's about as long as it's been something. Uh, I was on the uh, launch team of WashingtonPost.com uh, in April 19, or I'm sorry, June 1996. So I've been doing this for a long time and, and have grown as a leader, I think, because I'm working, I was working in an industry and have been for a long time that very much has a very traditional way of doing things. The newspaper, the TV broadcast, the radio broadcast, magazine routine is very, very, very formula. And it, one thing that systems don't like in journalism is change and, and a new way of doing things. And that's all digital has been for journalism now for 20 years. It's completely taken away all of the um, structure you know, a newspaper comes out once a day, and I remember being at the Post when I was, I was at the newspaper for eight years before I went to digital, and I remember you'd put the paper to bed at 2.30 in the morning, the last edition would go out then, and if a huge story happened at 3 in the morning, you just went, oh well, went home, went to sleep. And those days are, you know, clearly over now where news organizations have to function on a 24-7 basis. Um, they often have to publish directly to a platform without going through editing, which 
most reporters will tell you is the scariest part of, of digital. So everything has changed, and so leadership had to change, and leadership, you know, in this digital age has to be completely different than it was in, the, in that different generation, and it has to reward things like risk-taking, and it has to reward um, ideas that are completely antithetical to uh, traditional journalism. And so I think, you know, having, I think one of the reasons I've been in it for so long and have done relatively well in it is because that was always the most exciting part to me. But, and I, you know, um, for the first five years I was working in digital, I kind of had this feeling of, uh, to re reference a, a very high-end film called Animal House. Um, it was that moment when uh, Bluto is trying to fire everybody up and he runs out of the room and nobody follows him. And that was sort of the first five years of working in digital and journalism. You think you, all you see is exciting opportunities for how to tell stories and how to connect people. And all the people you're talking to see is how tomorrow is going to be so different than today. And that scares the hell out of them. And so I think, you know, that helped shape me as a leader, which is you have to figure out not how to tell people to do things. Because if you've spent much time in newsrooms, you know how well they love to be told to do things. Um, you, have to con you have to really inspire them to believe that the things that got you into this business, telling stories and changing lives and affecting society, can happen at a, you know, at, at an exponential way now, in a way that was actually in some ways harder pre-internet. Um, and so I think that has been what shaped me as a leader, which is not being willing to accept that moment where you run out of the room and, and nobody follows you. And, and so I think, you know, I've spent a lot of years trying to sh do it by showing, which is always the best way a leader can do anything, which is that you go off and do it. And, and, uh, and so, I mean, I think that's, to me, the, you know, I view leadership as, and I think the authenticity line that was raised before is a really important one. I, I view how being a leader is, uh, and to put it in another sports, con or sports context, is like when you're a running back in football, you get the ball, you gotta, you gotta move. Like you gotta, you gotta see where the, you think the hole is and go toward that hole. And if you stand there looking around for a hole to go through, you're gonna end up getting that. You're gonna get nailed. And I think for leaders, you have to be authentic. Because that if, a lack of authenticity is that moment where you're sitting there trying to think about what people want you to do, as opposed to what your gut tells you to do. And I think the minute you do that, you freeze and you and you not only don't solve the problem that's in front of you, but you start to you, just, you start to have the people who are supposed to be following you kind of wonder whether you really believe what you're up there saying. And the one thing I don't think anybody has said about me in 20 years of leadership is that I think the guy's out there spinning or uh, telling me what I want to hear. I think if nothing, I'd probably err too much on the other side of that. But, but I think in a world that's still trying to figure out its way, in a world that's still changing, I think, you know, I was just at a conference last week and a guy was presenting about where he sees, you know, digital, the digital world in 20 years. And he said, guys, we're still in like the, you know, we're still in like the top of the second inning of this game we call the digital transformation. I mean, he was showing stuff up there about, you know, unbelievable things that are happening in other industries. And so, I mean, I think that, you know, the only way you can survive in this is to, sh to show that fearlessness, that, you're, that you actually embrace the fact that the world is so unsettled and so uh, unpredictable as opposed to looking for that structure to fall into. I think that's why, I, my opinion is why so many newsrooms in this country are struggling right now, is they can't quite break out of this routine that says, you know, point A to point B, point B to point C, and anything outside of that is scary and frightening. And I think part of the reason um, you're starting to see uh, that change now in journalism where there's really an embracing of the fact that the world is different is because the people who grew up in this digital era are now starting to move into management and they're bringing with them some of those same mindsets, which is fearlessness, risk-taking, are just things you have to do now. The biggest risk in journalism is to not do anything differently than we've been doing it. Thank you, Mr. Brady. All right, our next panelist is Mrs. Renee Forney. She is the Executive Director for the Department of Homeland Security's Cyber Skills Management Support Initiative, where she leads cybersecurity related projects and programs. She was also the Deputy Director for the Department of Homeland Security's Balanced Workforce Program Management Office. Uh, at the General Services Administration, the GSA, she was the Branch Chief within the Business Intelligence Division, and she's also held several information and technology related jobs in the private sector. Please help me in welcoming, welcoming Mrs. Forney.
to speak to students who are about to start their careers, who are about to go out there in this world and create and do things um, that we don't even have any idea what they're going to do. The ones who are going to come and take my job so I can go home and retire. <laughs> um, I want to say to you all just a few things about leadership. A few of my key ideas are, first of all, be true to yourself. Be very true to yourself. When you sit at the table, someone should know who they're getting. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So be true to yourself. When a person sits across the table from you, they should know exactly who and what they are getting. You should not change with the wind. It makes it very difficult to operate, as our earlier speaker does. The only thing that that does is bring about confusion and disorder. It's hard to lead in that environment. So be very, very true to who you are. You come to this world with innate qualities and abilities. Lean into them. Don't forget them. We come to institutions of higher learning to take those abilities and allow them to be groomed and shaped. But spend some time focusing on what your innate qualities and abilities are that you bring to the table. Take care of your people. Make sure that your people know, without a shadow of a doubt, that you have their back. Make sure that when you're leading up, the people that you are supporting know, without a shadow of a doubt, that you are in their corner and that you too have their back. That's very important. What that does is it helps you build relationships. Like it or not, things in this world, a good portion of them, and I'm sure some of our senior leaders here and the panelists will say, yes, things happen based on relationships. So build good, solid relationships. When you're taking care of your people, make sure that you see the individual as well as the group. Because we all wake up as individuals each day. That's how we start out each day. So when you're looking at the individual and you see the uniqueness of the individual, also spend time thinking about the similarities and where there's synergies in the group. The goal is to build a unity of effort. You're all moving toward one goal, and in order to achieve that, you have to have a unity of effort. It's very difficult to have that unity of effort when you don't see the individual. At DHS, DHS has about 260,000 employees. We're made up of components that I'm sure you all hear of quite often in the news, Secret Service, TSA, ICE, CBP, U.S. Coast Guard, all of which have individual missions that are unique. But at the same time, we have an overall mission, and that is to protect our homeland. So in order to effectively do that, we have to build a unity of effort. Now, throughout my career, um, I think that early on, I always focused on building that unity of effort. And I think that is one of the things that has helped me be successful. That I've taken the time to see that individual and then to look at the group. In this world of transparency that we're in, there are times where you might necess not necessarily be as transparent as you really want to be. Because you might hold a position that does not allow that. But I will say to you, when you cannot be transparent, be honest. And always fall back on, always fall back on yourself. 
and being true to yourself. Thank you very much. All right, next up is Dr. Maria Zuber. She is the Vice President for Research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, with overall responsibility for over a dozen very impressive research laboratories and centers. She was the head of department or the head of the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences from 2003 to 2011. She's held leadership roles associated with scientific scientific experiments or instrumentation on nine NASA missions and remains involved with six of those and is the principal investigator for NASA's GRAIL mission, which is an effort to map the moon's gravitational field. She has won a number, like a lot, of distinguished awards, including uh, Discover Magazine's one of the 50 most important women in science and the US News Harvard Kennedy, set, uh, Kennedy School list of America's best leaders. And if that's not enough, uh, Dr. Zuber was appointed to the National Science Board by President Obama in 2013. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Zuber. Great, thanks, thanks everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and to talk to all of you. So, um, so I'm a scientist and, um, and if you want to be a leader in science, job one is that you have got to be viewed as a good scientist. Okay. That is not a sufficient condition, but that is an absolutely necessary condition. So in this, um, in this panel about leading in the digital age, so I thought I'd start with just a story about my own career. So, um, so when I was starting out, uh, like a really long time ago, um, uh, there, were, there were no women in my field. So I, uh, I'm a geophysicist and I do space-based laser and radio systems and there were no women. And so when I started um, my career, I always published with my initials, okay? Um, because I said, you know, if I publish with my full name, they would see that I was a woman and no one would read my papers and they wouldn't take me seriously. And, you know, you know quite frankly, this is really pathetic, all right? Um, but, uh, but I'm not by any means the only women who, woman who did something like this, okay? In fact, I was uh, ha uh, talking on Friday with the uh, chief technology officer of uh, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory and telling her about what I was going to talk about today, and she says, oh, I did the same thing. Okay. And um, so, uh, so all my colleagues and my mentors, uh, who really uh, had my best interests in mind, they all thought that this was ridiculous. And you know, first of all, everyone knows you're a woman anyway, and, uh, and it wouldn't make any difference. Okay? So, um, so a little ways into my career, uh, I gave a talk at a major um, scientific conference in Moscow, and, uh, and I got up on the stage, group about this big, and I was giving my talk, and, uh, and it was clear that everybody in the room was staring at me, okay? Not looking at me, staring at me. So I didn't know whether I'm having a wardrobe malfunction or <laughs> what, okay? Uh, but I get through my talk, and I, uh, afterwards was the, uh, the break, and uh, I went down to get some tea, and I was just surrounded uh, by um, men, all right, because, uh, and they all said, you're a woman, okay? And, um, and then they started apologizing to me, uh, because we've been reading your papers for years, and we've just assumed that you were a man, and this is, how, how could we have done something like this? So, you know, so the question is, would they have read my papers be starting out if I would? We don't know, okay? A um, couple of decades later, um, the 50th anniversary of the launch of Sputnik, um, there was a major conference um, put forth uh, by the Russian Academy of Sciences and um, mostly Russian speakers, a handful of international speakers, and at that um, celebration symposium, um, I spoke, and, uh, and not only was I the only woman who spoke at this, but I was the only person who hadn't actually been born at the time that Sputnik had launched, okay? So everybody else was up there talking about 
where they had been and what they were doing at the time that they heard about the launch of Sputnik. And, um, and I, was, uh, I was just talking about science. Right? And, you know, so, you know, I often wonder whether or not there was any relationship that, uh, between those events that um, uh, all of the Russians knew me and they made their opinion um, about me. And we can't actually know this, but what, what is clearly the message to take away from this is that I controlled the narrative. Okay, so in a digital age, how do you control the narrative of what you would like to be perceived at as that shows a relationship to actually what you really are? Okay, so, um, so one thing, if you're a scientific leader, you want to be viewed as a good scientist. And the other thing that is crucially important is your values. Okay, how do you convey your values? in the digital age. Okay, so if you get on the web and you look at my website, okay, not my boring administrative website, okay, but my research website, um, you'll see several things. Okay, first is a long list of publications. So, okay, she's the good scientist. All right, we got that part covered. All right, the other thing you see is uh, a real emphasis on my students and postdocs, so I love to highlight the work that they do and actually uh, really um, are responsible for putting out the good work that gets done. So you never lose by giving other people credit. Uh, the next thing that you see are lots of pictures of my husband and kids, so I'm very, very committed to my family. And the third thing that you will see is that I have hobbies, okay? and um, and. Those are the things that I want conveyed to the world. Uh, because one of the things that I'm very interested in is career development for young people and especially promoting um, STEM education. And so in a very small way, I can convey that, hey, out there, you can be a good scientist or you can be good at whatever your field is and, uh, and you can have a life, okay? You can give other people credit, you can love your family, and you can have hobbies. And so um, what I would say to all of you is think about the narrative in this digital age of what you would like to convey to people about yourself that shows in some small way what you're really all about. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. All right, last but certainly not least is Dr. Courtney Raj. She is a journalist, researcher, and free expression advocate with the Committee to Protect Journalists. She worked for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organizations, it's UNESCO's, Section for Freedom of Expression, where she coordinated the organi organization's strategy in the Arab region. She's the senior program manager, or was the senior program manager for the Global Freedom of Expression campaign at Freedom House. Uh, she writes and speaks about the intersection of media, technology, and human rights, with a particular emphasis on gender and the Middle East. She's a blogger for the Huffington Post and is writing a book based on digital dissidents and political change, cyber activism, and citizen journalism in Egypt. Please help me welcome Dr. Ratch. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and I'm so honored to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, it's interesting listening to, to the different perceptions on, on how to tackle this um, this topic and I think that I'd like to start with a little bit about my story and get to some of the issues of I mean you're all within a structure but I think many people will also be seeking to play a leadership role outside of a formal structure and what does that mean um, in in the digital age so I wanted to be at the intersection of technology and media and got involved um, in in the Middle East and I decided to go um, to Egypt to do my doctoral research and look at the political impact of new media, which back then um, I thought meant satellite television, and that's kind of what everyone in the field was writing about. And I got there um, that the first day. I went to a protest at the press syndicate because I'm the kind of person that runs towards where the action is and not away from it. And I met a blogger, and I was like, hey, this is something new. Um, this, no one's writing about this. And I wanted, as a young um, academic, as a young journalist, to be doing something 
different and unique that would set me apart. And I think that's one thing um, about leadership is, is the setting apart, right? A leader has to set themselves apart in what they are doing. And so I decided to focus on looking at the political impact of cyber activism in Egypt, and this was back in 2006. So I had faced a lot of obstacles from my committee um, who were like, how can you talk about the political impact of blogging when only 12% of the Egyptian population is even online and many fewer are, are blogging? But what I saw were these amazing young people around me who were literally leading their generation through what I thought would be a process of political change. And as, of course, you all know, there was an uprising in 2011. And a lot of the people that I got to know during that process were the leaders of the revolution, such as Ala Abdel Fattah, who decided that he established himself as a leader um, through, as, as uh, you know, the other panelists were talking about, helping others and being a resource for others and highlighting their work. And specifically, this was in the technological domain, teaching people how to blog, how to use Linux, and how to organize, how to use those tools um, to organize politically and, and on the streets. Um, unfortunately, now he's in jail under the new regime. There was another woman, um, Maryam al Hawaja, who was a leader of um, a Bahraini young cyber activist who became a leader because her father and her sister were put in jail um, as the Bahraini authorities tried to clamp down on political protest in that country. And she found herself um, in self-imposed exile from Bahrain and having to take on this mantle of leadership not only for her family but for her country so that the world would know what was really happening in Bahrain. And she did this, both of them, did this through the really um, using social media as a way to connect with people around the world and to build networks and communities of people who saw them as leaders and, and certified them as leaders. Um, I think what's really interesting is to look at something like a structured organization like the military versus kind of what leadership means in this interconnected networked world. So one of the things we know is that there can be certification by epistemic communities. And whether these are communities of journalists or communities of other experts or communities of peers, you can really use social media in an important way um, to build that reputation and to get that certification. Because you might think you're a leader, but if nobody else sees you're a leader, are you? I don't know. I think you have to have followers to be a leader. And so one of the things that I think social media is really good for is building up that reputation and getting that certification, even if you're young, even if you're a blogger, even if you're a woman and you're outside of the traditional um, mechanisms of authority that exist in your society. So one of the things I decided to do as I was on this long, long journey to get a PhD was to start a blog because anybody can start a blog and that was a way that I wanted to start building my reputation online. So I started that back in 2006. And thank goodness, because the PhD took a long time. And if I had waited to publish, you know, to get that external certification um, by academia, I would have lost the opportunity to be seen as a leader in talking about cyber activism in the Middle East when the uprisings um, came about. And so I think one of the things that this taught me is that authority structures in a networked digital environment are different than they are um, in traditional authority structures. So um, you, I think, have a very formal process in the military for rising up through the ranks, but it's quite different um, in the digital networked environment. Uh, you can see things from people around the world. Uh, you have to think about what you're conveying in social media and how that is triggering the algorithms that will increase your popularity or network you into those communities that you care about becoming a leader in. And so you see people like that, you see people trying to um, take advantage of the algorithmics of visibility. And that's one of the important things for leaders to remember is because we live in this interconnected world, there is no such thing as the offline and the online. There's no virtual and real. I mean, it is one world. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here since many of you look like you're digital natives and millennials. Um, you know this. And I think that um, one of the things with 
traditional leaders is not realizing this. And that's why you see in the news so often that, you know, a so-called leader, whether it's, you know, a coach of a sports team or, or a politician, um, does something on social media that is not authentic, that does not actually uphold their values, um, or maybe it is upholding their values but contradicts with their stated values. And that's so visible in a way that we've, you know, it's never really been visible um, to the population at large. And so that goes back to another point that was made earlier. You have to be authentic, and it's more than just talk. You have to also back that up with actions. Because if you say one thing, and then your social media or your pictures or the videos that you're posting on YouTube say something else, it's really easy to see that hypocrisy now. So that's why you saw in the wake of the Paris attacks, the Charlie Hebdo, 40 world leaders going to march, um, to march there. They're world leaders, so they've been designated as leaders. But then when you look at their, their, their marching in support of freedom of expression, but then the president of Gabon prohibits all demonstrations in his country, or um, the president of Israel and Palestine um, don't have free speech for their citizens um, or for journalists, don't allow full freedom of expression there, or the president of um, Eritrea or Ethiopia where journalists are in prison. You know, you can see this hypocrisy much more. And so I think that as a leader, you have to think about the fact that these two worlds are mutually constructed and interconnected. And so not everything is under your control. Um, I think maybe in the past, as a leader, you could think it's very much about my interpersonal reactions and interactions with people. And um, I think it's very important to support the people who are in your you know, physical proximity to you and the people who are on your team. But you also have to think about um, the validation by users and algorithms in the public sphere because that is part of being a public leader um, in the digital networked environment. So I think with that, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so I will direct your attention to the microphones at the front of either aisle. Um, you think of questions, just line up behind the microphone, introduce yourself to us, tell us where you're from, and as you all know, we have four really diverse, interesting panelists, and let's challenge them a little bit. Well, we've got the first question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So having, um, uh, so first of all, I would say having managers who have some knowledge of science could really help a lot there. Um, but that isn't the only solution to the question. I think, um, uh, I think scientists have long suffered from um, speaking only to each other. And, um, and so uh, it's almost like twins talking where nobody outside of science can understand um, uh, what they're talking about. And, um, and so, uh, so as scientists and technologists, I feel it's incumbent upon us to think really hard about um, conveying um, the message of, uh, of science and technology to people who don't have a background there. And, and, um, and that doesn't come automatically. And, um, and so any steps that can be taken um, along, those, uh, uh, along that area is, is uh, the way to start, I think. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Midshipman First Class Sam Cohen. I'm from Yale College. Um, my question, actually, before I start, Dr. Zuber, J.K. Rowling did the same thing with the initials when she published Harry Potter, so just a note. But uh, Dr. Zuber, um, you talked about sort of crowdsourcing validation um, in sort of the, the virtual world, or the real world and virtual world. And I wanted to know um, from all of you, is that a good thing? I mean, should validation, external validation from experts be coming from uh, sort of people you don't, who don't is crowdsourced validation better than sort of expert validation? I guess is the question. Um, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that the academic validation is absolutely essential, and expert validation really does matter. But without the 
external validation provided by the crowd or if the crowd does not follow those certification mechanisms, then you're gonna face a real barrier. Um, you know, I think it depends, again, what context you're looking for in terms of being a leader, but I think um, you, you need both, essentially. But at the same time, you can't just pander to the crowd, right? You have to maintain the, your authenticity and you have to maintain your personal um, value system throughout those two different mechanisms. Thanks. All right, quick admin note before our next question. I was just told that the name tags of Dr. Zuber and Dr. Raj are actually switched, which you probably knew. We can't see it from here. So that would make more do you want to just trade? That's, is that all right? Oh. And for our game of musical chairs, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. <laughs> All right, so next question. Are we working on the mic? Are we up? Is that a general question for the panel? Well, would, Have at it. I would say that um, there has to be a level of confidence in what you know. But there also has to be a level of humility and understanding of what you don't know. So don't misconstrue when you hear us saying that be true to yourself, focus on self, 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 self. It's not all about just self, but an understanding of self. So for me, um, like the doctor here, I was a geeky girl. I, you all were, <laughs> okay, I'm fine with being a geek. I'm not very proud of it. Um, I was not born in technology, like most of you all in this room. I was um, post punch card day. So in coming up through that era and being able to grow up with the technology and face the challenges of walking into that world of technology, which was very non-traditional for someone like me, I had to be honest with myself, but at the same time be confident, which is a very thin line very, very thin line. Finding that line will come to you all as you mature in your leadership. It's not overnight. It's not overnight. Um, so I think that if you, if you think about I'm being true to me, being true in understanding what I know and what I don't know, and realizing that you do not do it alone, when you're trying to reach that common goal, it is that team, it is that people, it is that group, that support system that you need in order to achieve that goal. Again, as you mature, you will begin to see, and that line will become clearer to you. Um, never let a person drive you into thinking that that line is arrogance, because that's something that creeps in sometimes when confidence is there. And sometimes people can misconstrue that and they think it's arrogance when you're really, I am confident in this because a leader does have to be confident. Um, I was working with um, the 
know, retired Admiral Thad Allen, and he talked about a challenge that he was facing during Katrina. And one of the things that he saw immediately was that the people in the group, everybody that was there to support that, had to see that the leader was confident. Because if the leader isn't confident, then how can the followers be confident and have the ability to execute within that space? So don't worry about not having it all right now, because you won't, because it comes through time. It comes through maturity. Like the superintendent said, you have to be immersed in it, and as you are immersed in it, you grow it. So it'll come. I would love to add something to that because I think that many of you are in the process of becoming leaders. And I think that by staying true to your fundamental values and taking a stand, that can help you transition into a role of leadership. So um, I, I lived in Dubai. I was recruited to be a managing editor of an Arabic website. And I knew um, it, there were going to be certain red lines around, you know, not covering Saudi human rights or women's rights abuses. I knew that going in, but I thought, like, it's going to be a really interesting and useful experience to be inside the belly of the beast. Um, but I found that when those red lines, when I was prevented from publishing an article about safety problems, um, that that was a red line for me as a journalist. And so I took a stand and refused not to publish this story. And I was fired the next day and kicked out of the country. I think if that hadn't happened, I would have a very different life now because as a freedom of expression advocate, as somebody who you know, talks to journalists about standing up to censorship, who advocates with foreign governments and our own um, to stand up on behalf of journalists and to provide a context for press freedom, I would be in a less, um, I wouldn't be in, in, in the position that I am now if I hadn't taken that principled stand. And so that can also help propel you. And I think, you know, this this is a very different between staying true to your principles and being selfish. Yeah, and I could add to that too. I think I agree with everything that's been said so far, especially acknowledging what you don't know um, is very important because nobody, nobody who works for you will ever believe or works with you will ever believe you have the answers to everything. I think good leadership is, you know, is a combination of hard skills and soft skills. I think. Uh, you know, being able to inspire people and be able to get up there and get people who want to charge out of the room is really important, but you have to have soft skills to go at that too. And I, you know, one of the ones that I've, you know, that the old, the old joke is always, you, you were given two ears and one mouth, so use them in that proportion. Um, it's important to listen. And I think a lot of leaders feel like they always have to be the ones talking and, and filling the space and, and quiet. And I think it's really important to observe and watch small, small things that are happening in room, you know, in, in, with your staff and with people. And I always think that one of the skills that I'm lucky enough to have is I can read a room. I can walk into a room with a plan and immediately know that this isn't the right day to do the thing I was going, I came in here to do, and I'm gonna completely scrap it and do something totally different. And you have to have that skill. If you go in with a plan and that plan just can't change no matter what, you know, you're gonna have a tough time managing people because people are, you know, the most complicated technology we deal with every day is the human brain. And I think it's really important to have that. And I think one, the way I've always looked at leadership, good leadership, it's bad leadership is like credit card debt. You know, every, if you tell somebody what something, when somebody comes up to you and, and asks you a question and you give them the answer they want, you have that immediate satisfaction of getting, you know, but you're, you're building up a lot of debt with your staff if you're telling them what they want to hear and not what you actually believe. And good leadership's an investment. And you find out years later, in some cases, the impact you had on somebody. You may not get the feeling you want at that moment. You may have to give them tough news, and they may look at you like they want to take a swing at you. But a lot of times, five years later, that person will come back and say, thank you for doing that. It set me on a path. So you have to really look at it that way, that short-term satisfaction is almost a, always a bad thing. Uh, in fact, it is always a bad thing if it's not authentic. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Stephen Heber Weber. I'm a Stamp Scholar from the University of Miami. And uh, my question is more directed toward Dr. Rash and uh, Mr. Brady. Um, how do you stay true to yourself when, you know, freedom of press is not a worldwide phenomenon and you both are in the journalist industry? How do you stay true to yourself? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I probably would be who I am, regardless what industry I'm in. Maybe I'm in the industry partially because of, uh, uh, but I, mean, I think you stay true to yourself just by exhibiting all the things I think the panelists have said, vulnerability, um, 
a, an acknowledgement that you're not right all the time. And, you know, I mean, nobody, I go home, I went home a lot of days when I was at the Post and we were doing something really risky. I mean, the whole idea when I was at WashingtonPost.com was let's do everything differently than other newspapers are doing online right now. Let's just try stuff nobody's tried before. We were the first big U.S. news site to launch comments and start their own blogs and do these really wonderful long-form documentary. But, I mean, there were a lot of things we tried that there was no path for. And, and I think the, you know, this idea that you have to show confidence is important. But there were a lot of days I went home after showing confidence for eight hours and, like, almost wanted to cry because I was horrified of what might happen the next day. But you have to, you have to kind of put that behind you so your staff can follow. But... I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, staying authentic is either something that comes naturally or it doesn't, I guess. I mean, I, I can't imagine being anybody but who I am, and I think that's really worked in my favor. I think that's why I keep going back to that metaphor, and I'm sorry I speak in metaphors all the time, but of like being a running back, which is you, if, you're, if you ever stop to think, what should I do here to satisfy the people who are making the decision for, you're probably not thinking in the right, looking through the right lens. It's got to be, I mean, obviously informed by lots of information. I mean, you're not just, if you're working off that gut without any information, that's probably just as bad. But if, assuming you have the information necessary to make a decision, I think pausing and, and, and you know, is, is always an opportunity for people to see you as not authentic. Um, I think as a human rights advocate, it's particularly important that the, you know, actions and public perception, you know, oftentimes gleaned through social media um, match with what I'm out advocating for. And so, um, regardless of the venue, whether it's, you know, the UN Human Rights Council or the, you know, Information Minister in Uganda or the Azerbaijani Ambassador or, you know, the General Counsel to the President here, is having a consistent message that's true to the values of freedom of expression, of human rights, and really understanding how those are intertwined. And I think, um, you know, going back to the question that was kind of asked earlier about crowdsource versus academic expertise, I mean, I think just having, um, as a leader, building your authenticity across platforms. So in the, you know, real and the virtual world and, and all of that is really important because um, if you're out there advocating for something, you don't know how that person might be looking into, you know, who you are or who they're dealing with. And, you know, I think staying authentic and staying true to those values, but still always being respectful, right? Um, being, you know, willing to listen and that will make you a better leader. If you're trying to be a leader, um, you know, in the press freedom community, understanding those who press back or why, you know, I'm about to go to Egypt in a couple of weeks and I want to go there because I want to hear from um, the ministers there why they are jailing journalists, why they've put the youth activists in prison. Like, I really want to understand not through a filter of the media, but from them, because only then can I really develop effective strategies for trying to help them. Thank you. Good morning, Mitch. I'm in first class. Tyler Toppenberg from Texas A&M. My question is directed at Ms. Forney and Mr. Brady. Um, as future military leaders were taught that mission accomplishment is everything, and I feel that mission accomplishment and being authentic can sometimes have a battle between each other. So my question is, should leaders care and strive to be perceived authentic and exhibit good characteristics, or should they focus more on mission accomplishment results rather than perception? Well, I don't think you can. I don't think you can separate the two. Um, I mean, I think you know. I mean, if you have to be unauthentic to accomplish the mission, I guess I'd question what the mission is you're you're, you're going after there. Um, I mean, I think, and and if you do find that those are in alignment, you're probably in the wrong job. Um, so I think that, I, to me at least, those two things, I've never been in a position where I, I had to become somebody I didn't want to become. And there are, I have worked at a few places where that's happened and I've left. Um, and that probably to my own fiscal uh, uh, down, you know, it was probably not the smartest idea in all of the times I did it. But, you know, that's, that's sort of, you just decide you can't do something. You just walk out and then go, what the hell did I just do? But I think, I don't think you can separate. No, I agree. You can't, you can't separate. So. Um, mission and execution of the mission is key. So you have to find a way to execute successfully. I think that there are times when you are placed in situations in which decisions are made and those decisions are made where you only have a very narrow scope of information, where someone else might have a larger of that. 
you not having some of that information might make you feel as if you're being untrue to yourself. So take a second to first think about before you, before you really say, oh no, this is totally against everything that I agree with. You have to take the whole picture into consideration. I, like you, I don't think I've ever been placed in a situation where whatever I'm being asked to do is going against my core value system. But I have been placed in numerous situations where I see execution going in a direction and I don't necessarily know why it's going in that direction, but later it was revealed to me that I was working with a very limited <coughs> scope of the information. So I caution you with making a rush decision to think that it's actually going against whatever your values are. And like was previous said, if it does go against what your values are, then you question, am I in the right space? And I even say that's why the chain of leadership is so important because you're, if you, and I've, I've been placed in that same situation where I didn't necessarily have all the information and I was told I did not have all the information, but I was told it by somebody I trusted, by somebody who I had worked for, who I had faith in who said, look, you know, I would tell you most of the time, I can't tell you this. And that's when my relationship with that person becomes the key. And that's, the, you know, if you have that up the chain. So I have stated, I have stated jobs too where I had to do things I didn't necessarily agree with with a limited scope, but I trusted the person who was telling me that they needed me to do it. And if it doesn't work, you leave. Thank you all very much. Hi, my name is Garrett Wood. I attend the University of Michigan and I'm from the great state of Michigan. Um, I just have a short eight-part question. I, I'm ju just kidding. It's for uh, Mr. Brady and Dr. Rash. Uh, current research suggests that when we people um, are posed with tough moral problems, we tend to reach a conclusion first and then find evidence that supports our existing conclusion. Um, with an almost unlimited supply of new sources and information, it's not hard to find these days. Once you've reached a conclusion, you can usually find evidence that supports that. Um, how do you recommend conveying your message and writing effectively to reach people that have come to a different conclusion than you and communicate with them to, to find understanding and agreement? Um, well, I mean, yeah, certainly the internet has allowed you to find myriad sources of information that will tell you you're the smartest person on earth um, if you look in the right places. So I think the key is, I mean, I think the way to make the best make the argument is to focus less on emotion and more on actual facts and data. Um, I think that pa passionate arguments on uh, the internet are a dime a dozen. I mean, that's, that's why there's Godwin's law, right, which is basically, I can't remember exactly what it says, but basically the probability that someone will reference the Nazis in a message board you know, increases to one, you know, eventually it'll happen because every bad message board ends up being some horrible argument. Um, I think you don't want to look there for your uh, people to change. I think you want to focus on logic, reason, um, and ha having that debate in a, in, a, in a way that I think is getting lost a little bit, which is, a, you know, I, I, I bemoan the fact that 10 years ago, and the internet has clearly helped feed this, but 10 years ago you go out to dinner with a friend who believed totally opposite of what you did in everything in politics, and You'd argue for an hour and a half, pay the bill, and do it a week later again, and it was kind of fun, and it made you think differently. That seems to be happening less, where you go out with friends now and express an opinion that's different, and they like never want to see you again. So I'm hoping that we're in that phase now where you're going to see a pullback from that, that a lot of times technology overshoots a certain thing, gets very, um, you know, reaches a certain breaking point, and then it snaps back a little bit. And I'm starting to, I feel like, at least in the last year, the political debates have been a little less... Um, but it may just be me. Uh, but I, I think, I think you just got to focus on taking the emotion out of it. I think that's what's that's what always brings in conversation. So I fundamentally disagree. I think it's becoming. Um, I think we're entering a much more a world where I'm much more concerned about that because you talk about okay, you go out to friends, you go out to dinner with your friends, and you disagree. But now your friends are decided from you based on who your other friends are and what your commonalities are and your date are arranged based on some sort of algorithm that's finding some sort of similarities with you that they think you're be compatible because other people like you have been compatible with people like them. So I think we're actually, I'm more concerned about information cocoons and I think if you look at the direction that the news business is heading with the personalization of news, with the fact that you sign into these services so that you can be tracked 
and the algorithms will serve you up the information that it thinks you want. What about the information that you might not want but you need? That's what I'm concerned about. And I think one way to get by that is to actually seek out um, different points of view. And so instead of just relying on, say, a, a media or, or your Facebook friends accounting of what was said in the State of the Union, listen to it yourself. Um, you know, or watch the broadcast network that you disagree with. I do that. It can be frustrating, but it's also incredibly enlightening. Um, and I think you know, how do you refute that? Absolutely with facts. I mean, definitely at the Committee to Protect Journalists, the core of our advocacy is the research. So that when we go to the Turkish government, which was the leading jailer of journalists for two years in a row, and we say, you're the leading jailer of journalists, and of course they hate that, um, you know, we can back up every single one of, I think it was 61 cases of journalists, 61, um, in a so-called democracy. Um, we can go back and say, okay, here are the individuals, each case, we know the facts, here's what, you know, you said they did, da da da, we can go in and investigate and go with facts. And so that's really important is to have the facts. But I think, you know, you've raised a really good point and I think you see this with the surveillance debate, right? So there's a lot of passion and people just seek out the information on whatever side that they believe in. But I think that if you look at the facts, right, not just this pr proclamations about you know, security that has supposedly, you know, been better by mass surveillance and the destruction of civil liberties and political rights through mass surveillance, you will see very little proof. You know, so it's, it's incumbent upon you to search out facts and to get around just the rhetoric that you see every day. Yeah, if I could just add something to that. So there's a, there's a real teachable moment here. So it, it used to be that we spent a great deal of our time educating people about where to find information. It was very difficult to find information, okay? Now we're living in an age where the amount of information out there is virtually limitless. And the real challenge is to figure out what in information is reliable and good. And, um, and so this, this gets on to what was being said down there as, uh, you know, as we, uh, as we teach and as we lead, you know, really looking dispassionately at what the important sources and the accurate sources of information are, are very important to the story. All right, thank you. Good morning, Oviedo Gambetta from the Peruvian Naval Academy, functionary of the Peruvian Navy. I'm a doctor in law, and I have just come yesterday from Peru to attend these sessions. Um, a leader is not born a leader. He has to be made educated to be a leader. And I was surprised, so profound, Mr. Hart's words in the beginning when he said strength and virtues. A leader has to be formed, educated. I have, perhaps because my Italian ancestors, the uh, idea of going to the roots of the word. Education comes from Latin educare. And educare in Latin means take you from this place to another place, take you from the not knowing situation to a knowing situation. The education of a leader, how is that made? It's a very, very, very important process of the leader. But as we are now, not in the era of Clark Kent, six years ago that he went with his notebook and his pencil and he wrote something about what he saw and then he went to his typewriter and then typed it in a mechanical typewriter. Now, in this era, the news create the facts. Six years ago, the facts created the news. And the leader has to be there. It has to be with a proper conceptual structures. And now, the use of words in this cybernetical era is very important. I quoted some words, even though they are put in the mouth of Mrs. Thatcher, but they were pronounced by Meryl Streep when she was asked with us about something, feelings, and she said, Meryl Streep says, in the words of Mrs. Thatcher, everybody's concerned about feelings, and I care about thoughts, ideas, and concepts. Those thoughts and concepts might turn into words and insights. The words and insights into actions, those actions into deeds, those deeds into habits, those habits into character, 
and character might define your future, so you become what you think. My question is to any one of the panelists, Ms. Forney, Dr. Raj, uh, we talk about the formation in values. Values are virtues. Virtues are habits. And the habits are the repetition of single acts. So a leader has to be like a jewel with a hammer, or perhaps like a statue with a hammer and chisel, form very, very, very thoroughly and with main ideas and to know how you have to form the leader. Leaders are not born that way, they have to be made. My question is, what means we have to use to form leaders? Thank you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Can we get another chair up here for you to come on? <laughs> So what a, what a remarkable um, sentiment. And, um, and so, I would, uh, so I, I would just say to that, um, it, it is very true that um, uh, aside from, say, the academies here, um, there, there, you know, in, in universities, there isn't a lot of um, uh, training in leadership. We get trained in disciplines. Uh, but we don't learn management, and we don't learn, um, and we don't learn how to lead, and um, and that's why. Actually, it's it's why I decided that I wanted to um, to speak at this conference because um, uh, raising the concept of leadership and um, and hearing stories um, is um, you know there's there's many many paths um, to becoming a good leader. And it really is, I think, honing's one, honing one's judgments. Uh, but I think um, it's, it's all a matter of, uh, of individual stories, okay? And seeing what works and what doesn't work. So it's, it's really an empirical, you know, you can't, you can't um, buy a book with, a, you know, just a formula for you do these things and, and you're a leader. And, um, and by hearing uh, the stories and hearing what works and doesn't work, it helps you shape your judgments in the same way that you would, you know, create a sculpture, and um, and and so I, you know, I greatly um, agree with what you say, but but there, you know, there is no rule book on this. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I mean, I, you know, I think everybody does have their own story. I mean, I, I, I learned a lot watching my father, who was, uh, you know, in, high, in the corporate world for a long time and in politics for a while, and just watched how he treated people and. And he told me early on in life that your goal to be a leader is not power, but impact. And if you want to impact people's lives and get into leadership, if you just want the power, then you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons. And so I think we probably all have people who influenced us in terms of how we shape the world. And I think that it's probably not two similar stories to how a leader becomes a leader. I think they're all chiseled differently. And a bunch of them are Venus de Milo, I guess, missing arms completely in some cases. But Sorry, if I can mention something. Some years ago, 1993, 94, Samuel Huntington wrote that book about civilizations, the clash of civilizations. And he said he, by that time that in the years to come, the uh, confrontation was not going to be from ideologies, from cultures. Perhaps where we were a word that six years ago perhaps would be appearing in the world, theocratic governments as it happens now with some Muslims countries. So the world has changed quite a lot. And the culture now, by the word culture in the United Nations, in the UNESCO, culture is not civilization. Culture is a cultivate, and when you say culture is to cultivate, and how you cultivate a farm, it's a low process, a low process, and, and it takes a time to work with the plow, seed, and then water, and then, then comes the harvest. So with the leader, you have a long, long process of forming one by one, and there are not magic solutions. So the being and the doing, you have how you enrich the being with culture. With culture nowadays, in my country, it happens, I guess, in the States as well, and some other places in the UK, I've lived some time, Slang is just a slang, but words mean realities. Reality 
is not precisely truth. Truth, Aristotle said, is a coincidence of my thinking with the reality of the being. So opinion is one thing and certitude is another. A leader, I think, has not to have too many opinions, but some real strong certitudes. That's what I think. I think that goes to some of the points that were made up here, which is you can't separate in a leader's actions of course. from their leadership. And I think you know, you're, you're talking about reality and truth, et cetera, but I think that we're very much in a period of time where you know, words and, and visuals and images, this interconnectivity can create a reality and it's unclear at some point you know, what came first. Um, and that's why it's really important to look at facts and to, and to look at authentic, you know, certified leaders, understand the reputation behind that, um, behind where you're getting your information from, because there is a lot of manipulation happening now. Of course it is. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Question. All right, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Hello, my name is Cadet Second Class Brian Yarbrough from the U.S. Air Force Academy. My question is, when you have a hard copy newspaper or science report, or you're standing face to face with someone, it's pretty easy to tell if they're being authentic, whether they're lying or that sort of thing. But once you get into the cyber realm, that shield of anonymity that a lot of people feel, how do you, first of all, verify that someone's being authentic on their blogs or um, tweets or whatever it may be? And also, how do you maintain that authenticity for yourself? Um, I think there's a fundamental difference between authenticity and truthfulness or validity. And I think that's not necessarily something we've teased out, but I think authentic is more than just being truthful or credible. But to get to how do you determine that online, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And that's why it's important that you have to realize that the virtual and the physical are mutually constituted um, with each other. If you think about the, how many of you guys have heard about the gay girl in Damascus um, fiasco a couple of years ago. There was a blogger, um, a woman in Damascus who had a blog, and one, I think she was uh, LGBT, and one day disappeared. And it set off this massive worldwide um, search for her, and all of the human rights groups put out press statements and, and press releases, and we had all verified, but we were like verifying with each other and then a few days later, it turned out that actually it was an American guy living in Scotland who was doing this as some sort of social experiment. And I think that was a real wake up moment because we realized, like we, when we really looked at it, we were all talking to each other and no one had actually met this person in real life. There was no way to trace that back. And so, you know, a lot of things have developed since then. There are um, all sorts of interesting, uh, verifiable you know, solutions for videos that have been developed. Um, we spend a lot of time at the Committee to Protect Journalists authenticating videos. So for example, the ISIS video with the beheading of the Japanese journalist that came out over the weekend, you know, we're not gonna put out a statement about that until we verify the authenticity because it has you know, real implications. But there's all sorts of tools that have been developed and you see journalists employing like Andy Carvin at, um, who was with NPR, and I think now he's with First Look Media or The Intercept, you know, doing really interesting um, things in this realm. But that's why you can't just, like, enter kind of the, the, the digi digital Twitterati world and then, you know, automatically know what you're doing. You have to have a high level of media information literacy. You need to figure out how to determine credibility. You need to see, you know, with the Egyptian bloggers, for example, having had a long you know, knowing several of them face to face and then knowing their profiles, I was able to then kind of authenticate to other journalists and human rights organizations who were real, you know, who were credible. Um, but, you know, I think oftentimes, especially like in the intelligence communities, you have to, ha you have to link the, the physical with the virtual. You've got to at some point be able to trace back um, either through your chains of trusted contacts or, or interlocutors or through direct experience. And I would say Andy Carvin's a good example. There's also a site called Storyful, uh, which basically their only, their only role is to verify that sources, to verify the validity of sources that are reporting something even a breaking news situation, like to say that this person is actually in the place they say they're in, we've contacted them, so that the rest of the Twitterati doesn't take something to run with it if it's not true. Yeah. So on the, on the scientific side, what I would say is, um, 
you know, what I tell my students all the time is, if you're doing something interesting, people will try to verify it. Okay, so, um, so if something gets put out there, um, yeah, science is self-cleansing. So someone will try to reproduce your experiment or your numerical model um, or test your theory. And, um, and so um, be careful what you put out there. Just like to say thank you to all of you for uh, giving us your insight. I know we really appreciate it. But my name is Justin Briscoe. I'm from uh, College of Those Arts in Missouri. Uh, and I've lived there 14 years, so I claim it as home. But my question um, is related to mistakes you all have made in leadership positions. I know I'm asking you to get vulnerable with us. Um, but what's the best mistake you ever made, and how did that help you become a better leader? I can take this one. I was just thinking about this, actually. You know, when I first, um, I mean, I got a lot to choose from, but um, when I first got the job at WashingtonPost.com, you know, I really changed the culture and from a culture of just taking what the newspaper was printing and putting it on the website to like, let's think about how we're going to tell stories in a digital way. And I had a very inspired newsroom. I had one guy who was a friend, a guy I had worked with in my first stint at the Post, who wasn't doing what I needed him to do. And I kept moving him around. I kept trying to find the right job for him. I put him in three or four different positions. And in all the cases, he was taking advantage of the fact, I think, that we were friends and, and I wasn't doing what I needed to do. And my managing editor came in one day and said, you need to do something about X person. I won't name him. But I said, yeah, it's not working out, is it? Right? He's really just making everybody crazy, isn't he? And she said, no, this is about you, man. This isn't about him. So we're out here kicking, we're killing ourselves for you because you finally like lit this place up with a sense of we're really going to take advantage of the internet. We're wondering why you're letting him do this. And it was really that like aha moment of like when you're running a, a room of 200 people, like your lack of action isn't about the person you're not going after. It was Daryl looking at you going, why am I working so hard for this guy if he's letting this guy who's a friend kind of coast? And I was like, I, you know, light bulb that went on. That probably should have gone on earlier, but I was definitely being a little too nice and and that person was gone rather quickly after that. But it was a really good lesson about how everybody's looking to you, even if you think they're looking at someone else on the staff. They're always looking to you for that leadership and that vision. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw one out. So, um, so I, um, I won an instrument to go to Mars um, but the year after I got out of grad school, and, um, and uh, the, uh, which was great. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the spacecraft was lost uh, three days before it got into orbit um, around Mars. And, um, and uh, it wasn't due to my um, instrument, uh, but, um, you know, but, uh, but we all failed, okay? And, um, and so uh, clearly uh, neither I nor anyone else on the mission was uh, attentive enough to um, to things outside uh, what's what's on our own little plate, okay, and so it um, it really sent a message uh, to me um, in the future that you gotta you know every everybody on the team either succeeds or, or fails, and um, and uh, you've got to be uh, you've got to be listening even when it's something that you don't think affects you because everything affects you, and um, and so as as leaders. Uh, you know, emerging leaders who are going to be dealing with uh, complex sets of people and complex systems, um, you know, be very careful um, about uh, just looking at what's on the computer screen in front of you. Listen to, uh, you know, what, learn everything that you can learn about the full system. For me, it was um, very, very early in my career um, when I first got a leadership position. I was promoted to leadership from within a team. And so uh, that means I had an inherited team. And I'm sure this will happen to you um, as you move throughout your career. You won't always get to pick the team for which you have to execute through. So I was um, promo promoted to leadership, and we had a deliverable that was due. And the, the incorrect decision that I made was being fearful because my gut was telling me I don't have the right resources here to execute. But because it was an inherited team that I had built relationships with, I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And we got it done, but we could have got it done quicker, definitely more efficiently. Um, 
And I think I had to, do, I had to fail that time. It, to me, it was a personal failure. To all of the people outside looking in, it was a success because we were still able to deliver. But I went home every night upset with my own self because, oh my God, we shouldn't have to do this. We shouldn't be doing this if I could only have the resources that I needed to execute. So it was a personal failure to me. But it was good that it happened at that point in my career because it set the tone for going forward. So as I moved forward, I would quickly make an assessment make sure I had what I needed. If I didn't have what I needed, I would resource myself appropriately in order to execute. But being that that was early in my career, having existing relationships, I had to mature. And I guess that's really what it was. But. I think for me, um, it's similarly being put in a situation of leadership on an existing team and not taking, um, not realizing that my core values, um, especially around freedom of expression um, and kind of the willingness to press boundaries and, and, and push the limits, um, and not taking the time to really understand how or if that fit into the team dynamics and um, what the career goals of each of the individual team members were uh, in order to figure out how that might fit in or not fit in with their Kind of broader planning. All right, thank you all so much. All right, hold on just one moment. Can I get a quick time check in the back? Last question, we're done. Okay, I'm so sorry. Hey, good news is you will have two more panels and lots of really interesting panelists to ask your questions to. All right, ladies and gentlemen, can you give me one more round of applause for our panelists, please? First of all, apologies for the uh, musical chairs. We're trying to keep things interesting this morning. Um, again, thank you so much for your remarks. We really appreciate it. To the crowd, thank you for the great questions. They're outstanding. Um, at this time, on behalf of the 2015 Naval Academy Leadership Conference, we'd like to present you all with a small token of our appreciation.